the process of seeing paintings or seeing anything else is less spontaneous and natural than we tend to believe. A large part of seeing depends upon habit and convention. All the paintings of the tradition used the convention of perspective which is unique to European art. Now perspective centers everything on the eye of the beholder. It is like a, a beam from a lighthouse, only instead of light traveling outwards, appearances travel in. And our tradition of art called those appearances reality. Perspective makes the eye the center of the visible world. But the human eye can only be in one place at a time. It takes its visible world with it as it walks. With the invention of the camera, everything changed. We could see things which were not there in front of us. Appearances could travel across the world. It was no longer so easy to think of appearances always traveling regularly to a single center. I am an eye, a mechanical eye. I, the machine, show your world the way only I can see it. I free myself for today and forever from human immobility. I'm in constant movement. I approach and pull away from objects. I creep under them. I move alongside a running horse's mouth. I fall and rise with the falling and rising bodies. This is I, the machine, maneuvering in the chaotic movements, recording one movement after another in the most complex combinations. Freed from the boundaries of time and space, I coordinate any and all points of the universe wherever I want them to be. My way leads towards the creation of a fresh perception of the world. Thus I explain, in a new way, the world unknown to you. Those words are from a manifesto written in 1923 by Ziga Vertov, the Russian film director. And the images are from a film he made in 1928 called The Man with a Movie Camera. The invention of the camera has changed not only what we see, but how we see it. And in a crucial but quite simple way, it has even changed paintings painted long before it was invented. The painting on the wall, like a human eye, can only be in one place at one time. The camera reproduces it, making it available in any size, anywhere, for any purpose. attempt at um, attempting to stay on the ball I have to make a confession I should you know being a good Roman Catholic boy I should go down on Saturday afternoons and they do the confessions you know with Father Monteleone or, or whoever it is down there St. Anthony's getting that getting that little cubicle and say Father forgive me for I have sinned I lied to my students I told them this thing was going to be up in short order by Friday and I just dropped the ball and he'll probably like tell me to like do like six for six Hail Marys and seventeen Our Fathers, and I'd be good with it. Um, I don't have time to go down there, my friends. I just have to admit to the fact that I dropped the ball once again, and this is going to probably be going up on Sunday night. Um, due to the fact that, and I won't like belabor this, but Bonjourno is currently—it's like I should have a little like ticker going on the bottom. 
Bonjour was currently on like day 14 or 15 of like a sinus infection that the antibiotics that said um, medical doctor prescribed to Bonjour it is day six, they're not working, my friends. They are not working, okay? It's like, it might have to do with my extraterrestrial constitution because I'm not really from this earth, but I just, I really don't know what's going on. So Bonjourno is still feeling like somewhat lethargic. Um, I'm not, you know, usually I like to like, I would like to think of this um, program as like this like really like cerebral version of Pee Wee's Playhouse and have all kinds of like digital effects and people visiting like Mr. McFeely or a talking balloon or whatever. It's just, I've just been so goddamn tired that um, I haven't been able to um, bring in all of those like accoutrements. So you're just going to have to settle for the bare bones variety of this. And I'm just going to have to let my scintillating personality, you know, kind of stand in for all of the, you know, the usual bells and whistles that we engage in in this class. Um, however, um, people have been getting back to me about prospective guest speakers um, for this class and intro to mass media and some really cool stuff is going on. Some really cool stuff in terms of um, guest speakers that um, are committing to uh, Skyping with us, uh, people related to media, people related to um, video games and journalism and writing books. So, you know, it's like, you know, once, once this thing actually breaks, um, I should be up in like full form. All right. All right. So anyway, bullet points, bullet points. What do we need for bullet points today? I'm going to finish up chapter one of Berger. Chapter one slash episode one. That's why I showed the little clip at the beginning. That comes from episode one. <coughs> and what he's talking about in that little clip is really kind of an encapsulation of the entire um, chapter. You know, this transition that goes on from, one, the first, the first transi transition that goes on, which is really the transition from primitive and non-representational and non-perspectival painting to perspective and depth and volume and classical painting. That will be an evolution. Then there's this transformation that goes on in classical painting due to what? The emergence of photography, the emergence of um, being able to walk around with a postcard of, you know, La Joconda or the Sistine Chapel or, um, you know, Picasso's the Guernica, you know, like walking around with a postcard of it as opposed to having to go to wherever it is and see it. And the, and the change in our attitudes and our, our way of, like, viewing um, these works of art. And we're also going to talk about, like, demystification more. I know we, like, scratched the surface of demyst this whole idea of demystification, all right? And uh, we're going to get more into that, what he means by demystification. Because what will happen due to the emer because Ultimately, what happens with the emergence of photography, at least in, in relation to everything, not just in relation to um, works of classical classical art, but works, but just going places, taking pictures, the whole act of taking pictures will change our view of the world. It will, it, it will, for all intents and purposes, change our way of seeing. Hence the title of the book. Um, and it will do it in, in, in interesting and not always, um, not always um, beneficial ways. All right? Because we're going to talk about the way that this culture industry, you know, we were talking about this kind of gated community that, of, of classical art and the keepers and maintainers of that, this kind of bourgeois elite that are the administrators of of, the cl of classical art as such and, and, and its attendant works, um, how they kind of um, play games with it. 
and try to keep it from the masses, you know. Um, and there'll be another strategy that they'll use um, to kind of stop what is essentially a democratizing influence of the photograph by um, ascribing a cash value to the original. All right, and we'll talk more about that. This is kind of tricky and it's kind of abstract. All right. What you should be doing as we speak, well, you should be watching this as we speak, actually, but what you should be doing right after you watch this and comment on this in a very pithy and nuanced and elegant way, making all kinds of numerous observations that Bonjoro never even thought of, you know, with this vervey and a plum and, you know, comment, your comment should almost be something that could be published in like a high-minded jerk like in Harper's you know that's what you, that's what you should aspire to with your comments you know as opposed to just good job Mr. B you know which is kind of you know it should be published in Harper's too but um what we should be doing after we watch this should be reading chapter two and watching episode two of ways of seeing all right now Having said that, chapter two deals with some things that, due to the whole infantilization process of the public school system and the ways in which um, censorship, I, just crazy stuff that happens at that level, um, some of you may be somewhat, this is the um, point where I run a disclaimer, on lecture two, on the lecture that, that I do on chapter two. And what is chapter two about, my friends? The representation primarily of the female nude in said classical art and the ways in which it was repurposed in not only in advertising, but in other less, more, less, more purient, purient, is that the word? Um, forms of, um, of exposure, all right? How the female nude was repurposed for things that people of a certain uh, moral, uh, of a certain moral narrow caste um, will find offensive, all right? And I need to run, run this disclaimer before Tuesday that there's gonna be nudity, folks. Yes, dare I say, there is going to be some nudity involved in that lecture, not me, all right, but the slides, all right. So if some of the, if you are so deeply ingrained in the evangelical ethos of turning one's eyes, I, I can like even give like a spoiler alert. I can be like, close your eyes, you know. It's like you don't want to see like that, you know. I could do that, or just run a general disclaimer ahead of time about said lecture. Is there anything there that's that um, um, scandalous? No, my friends. No. No, there is not. Um, but um, just giving a heads up about that. You know, ha having said that, um, guess what, folks? You know, once you move out of the arena, you know, of being babysat, you know, by by said high school apparatus, um, you are now in this realm in which pe there are actually people out there, like professionals and professors and academics that treat you like, for the first, perhaps for some of you, the first time in your life, you are being treated like A-D-U-L-T-S, you know, and it should be something liberating. You know, as opposed to um, frightening and uh, and harrowing. You know, um, we're all mature adults here now, folks, and that's how I treat you. You know, for the little kids, you know, they get Amelia Bedelia and Monsters Inc. and Moana and you know, Doctor Seuss. Here, you're playing with the big boys, all right, and we need to put our way our little toys and our little games and we need to become adults, all right? So that's my whole spiel on 
what's coming up the road on Tuesday. All right, let's get to the PowerPoints. We talked about <coughs> how Berger, for our, for his, for the purposes of his books, how he was going to define the image. The image for him, and because we've talked about a lot of other different um, instances of the image in our daily lives, in our collective lives, psych psychologically, you know, images, philosophically, images in our mind, remembrances, dreams, imagination. When Berger talks about images, he wants to talk about what? He wants to talk about things that are man-made. Things that are man-made, things that have been fashioned, things that have been artificed, things that have come out of homo fabricus, or man the fashioner, man the maker, you know, um, and that will fall, and that will fall under the purview of everything from art to photography to motion pictures to games to everything that didn't exist until we got there and got our dirty little hands all over it and decided, well, this is, looks good and this is art and, and all that. So he, he narrows what an image is for him. An image is uh, something that is fabricated. <clears throat> it's a sight that's been recreated or reproduced. It is an appearance or it is a set of appearances which have been detached from the place and time in which it first made its appearance and, pre and was preserved for a few moments or a few centuries from pages 9 and 10. We were talking about appearances. We were talking about representations of, some, of something that may or may not still be in existence. And also, and that would include things that never existed, right? You know, think about narrative films. Think about, you know, how we build these entire worlds, you know, within a film. Um, more often than not, you know, with the exception of documentaries, which were which are a fabrication in their own right, and I don't want to get take my documentary class. You want to learn about why documentaries can be as fake as anything else. Um, you know, it's like we're also talking about representations of things that may or may not have may not have existed, or things that no longer exist, or people. You know, photographs of people that are gone, films of people that are are deceased. You know, um, when we see a landscape, we situate ourselves in it. If we saw the art, we talked about this whole idea of how seeing, and I want to put it in a way in which it is not too complex. Seeing in many ways, there was a politics to seeing. There were cultural norms in the way that we see the world. You know, are we see? It's like, and hence, you know, the whole um, allegory of the Matrix once again asserts its its assumptions about the fact, you know, that we need to be able to pose the question to ourselves: Are there different ways of seeing reality? than the ones that have come down to us, you know? And um, is the way that we see reality that has been bequeathed to us through this long tradition of representation, journalism, and everything else, um, is there an underlying, are there underlying assumptions and or slash agendas to this particular way of seeing? that we call um, reality or perspective, perspectival reality or stuff, right? <clears throat> um, he says that in many ways we are, there's this assumption that he makes about power. And remember we were talking about all the gatekeepers of the art world. And he wants to make this assumption, he, he wants to um, unpack this idea that we're not um, seeing freely um, because there are so many different um, norms and assumptions that are made of us in a certain way that we are positioned in relation to not only classical art, but you know any kind of visual medium that... Um, implies certain norms and certain implies a certain consensus view 
of the way that we all see. That we're all on the same page more often than not when we go into a movie, you know, but, but we each take it up individually. But there is a kind of conformist presentation to this material in which everybody kind of gets it. And he wants to question a lot of these underly <coughs> underlying assumptions on how we get things. And he wants to um, challenge our ideas about perception and the way that we take things up, that there may be more um, enriching and more liberating ways, you know, um, of, of seeing, you know. He talks about, like, how we're being deprived of history. You know, this idea that um, we're not seeing things in historical context because we, we don't have the proper education or set of, like, critical tools to, like, look at something and position ourselves in, in relation to works of the past that is empowering, you know. And that all has to do with a recognition of our collective heritage and us as a people, you know, and how... There's a kind of, like, snootiness to the people that want to kind of keep this on, a, on their own kind of um, um, elite um, cultural level. You know, it's, it's, it's basically, like, the ways that any clique is formed. You know, how are cliques formed? You know, cliques, you know, whether it be high school, college, whether it be in the workplace... It is usually for uh, uh, clicks cannot really exist without there being a sense of um, collective elitism to them. Like in order for something to be a click, there needs to be a certain group or groups that um, are not allowed into it by its very nature. Right? You can't. It's like you know, if, if you have a click that includes everybody, it's really not a click. It's like, you know, and this clique of the cultural elite who were like the gatekeepers of this, of, of, of this heritage, all right? Um, in the end, the art of the past is being mystified because a privileged minority is striving to invent a history which can retrospectively justify the role of the ruling classes, all right? Justifying the role... <coughs> of the ruling classes. What does that mean? Walter Benjamin in his article, Work of The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, will speak to just that. Remember we were talking about the aura? And I gotta get a link out to you guys of that if you deem if you if you want to read that article, very famous article by um, the the cultural theor German cultural theorist Walter Benjamin. Um, from which the uh, uh, episode one was inspired. This idea of uh, justifying the, this aura that comes upon, comes with art. That it's a way that art becomes essentially a way of keeping us out of the clique. It keeps us in our place. And not just the relationship, but the forms will find that the things that classical art, the subjects that most of classical art will choose to depict will also be part of this kind of mind game that it will play with um, the lower classes, all right? And once again, we bring up the idea of the matrix in regards to this, you know? And, uh, and such a justification can no longer make sense in modern terms. He's saying now we're big, it's like now we put on our big boy pants and our big girl pants, you know, and we like see things and we, and we start to take back, you know, our, our relationship to our cultural heritage in a way that um, liberates us, right? Um, and so, uh, and so inevitably, it mystifies, right? We're trying to, so what's Berger trying to do? He's trying to demystify art for us. He's trying to demystify all this stuff and essentially give us the red pill or take off our Hoffman glasses or our rose-colored glasses or what have you to really start to 
change our way of seeing things, question our pr prior assumptions about the ways in which we took up art, and build more um, robust and life-affirming relationships to this thing, all right? So that we understand, so that it can work on us in some kind of beneficial way. That demystification sometimes, though, we know from the matrix comes at a cost. It comes at a price sometimes. And sometimes we call it what? We call it disillusionment, you know? The disillusionment with that we experience when, at least unconsciously, it's like we realize, like, oh, shit, there's no Santa Claus. It's been mom and dad. I hope I didn't blow anybody's game there. But, you know, there's no... Santa Claus, there's no tooth fairy, it's all been like this setup. And that kind of that kind of disheartening feeling at first, you know, that that you know, that disheartening feeling that Neo gets when Morpheus says, Guess what, kiddo? It's like it's like the world you knew is like it ain't it's like, guess what? We got a lot of work to do. Because what they told you, it was like bullshit. You know? And in place of that you know, we have this somewhat unsettling circumstance of power and authority, and I didn't know I was a slave. I didn't, I, I, you know, didn't know I was a slave. So this demystification process can initially be something that does not feel very good, you know. Um, and yet, we understand that through that initial knowledge, after that process, of taking the red pill. It's like, then it's like, okay, so what do we do? All right, so the world as we know it is a shit show, now what? At least we have the knowledge. <clears throat> and this is what writers like Berger and Susan Sontag and DeBoard and other people we're gonna talk, uh, we're gonna read, are going to say. They're going to say, you know, things, you know, you've, you've been getting gamed for a long time. Now that you know you can, like, flip it, you know, so that after that initial feeling of disillusionment, one has the tools, should, you know, um, you know, by, um, by nature of that knowledge, you know, acquire the tools to say, all right, it's like, how do we change it? How do we change it? The removal of mystery and confusion, you know, surrounding a topic or idea. Both in the episode and in the um, book, he talks about this painter Franz Hals, who was a 17th century Dutch, Dutch painter, who um, for most of his life had been destitute. You know, this brilliant Dutch master um, who had lived in poverty, you know, as per you know, the, the, the nature of artists at that time and had to rely constantly on charity and, 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 and was always, you know, it's like we have this whole history of, of, you know, artists that were later deemed, like, great, you know, like living in, in poverty a lot of times or living in um, the patronage of somebody else. You know, that would change, you know, later on when with the commodification of art that a lot of the, um, great art, and as, as you probably know, know, that, you know, by the time, by the 20th century, a lot of great artists um, or notable, or at least notable artists, may not, maybe not even great artists, became, you know, um, insanely wealthy um, due to um, their paintings, you know. Um, so he brings up this situation of Franz Halls, you know, um, and he says in the book, uh, let us consider a typical example of such mystification. He says a two volume work was recently published. When he says recently published, it was published probably in like 1973, um, on Franz Halls, this famous Dutch painter. It is the authoritative work to date on this painter. As a book of specialized art history, it is no better and no worse than the average. Um, so, he's not really a fan of it, one would say. He's not a fan of it. And he does, he does a lot of um, kind of 
writing off the critics of his time. He's he's kind of a badass that way. Yeah. Um, he says it. Um, he says about these paintings, the paintings of the regents and regentesses of the old men's almshouse, where said halls was probably residing, you know, on, and, and, and barely making it. He says, the last two great paintings of Franz Hals portray the governors and governesses of, the, of an almshouse for old paupers in the Dutch 17th century city of Harlem. They were officially commissioned portraits. Hals was an old man. He was over 80. He was destitute. He was going to he was going to freeze that winter unless um, public unless there was some act of public charity that was going to give him that he calls it Pete. Um, you know Pete. Um, probably what was used. Uh, um, um, light the uh, you know burn in the furnace like firewood. Um, and. Uh, most of its life he had been in debt during the winter of 1664, the year he began painting these pictures. He obtained three loads of peat on public charity, otherwise he would have frozen to death. Those who now sat for him were the administrators of such public charity. So basically, you know, here's Halls needing to paint these pictures of the well-off that, you know, by their largesse, by their magnanimous, you know, charity. And we know how the wealthy like to, you know, pat themselves on the back anytime they throw a little bone or, you know, some, some, some breadcrumbs at the, the, the less well-to-do, you know, and they want to let everybody in the world know about it. You know, and some wine and cheese ribbon cutting ceremony about how they care about the poor. Um, this is not unanalogous to what these people did. You know? So they were just like, well, you know, you're the greatest living painter around. It's like, we'll give you the P. I'm sure the deal was struck. You know, we'll, we'll let you live. <laughs> we'll let you live <clears throat> if you paint some portraits of us so that we can hang up and, and, and you know, look at and admire ourselves for our, our great selfless giving, you know, to you. So so now he's got to paint these assholes, okay? <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like having like a real dick of a boss, you know, how would you like it if like your boss, who's like a total dick, said, in order for you to keep working here, I know you're like a really good like painter, it's like, I want you to paint a a picture of me that I can hang at my house. All right. So this is the this is the setup. All right. The author of said book on Franz Halls records these facts about this these paintings. All right, and he says that it would be incorrect to read into the paintings any criticism of the sitters. This is the guy that Berger is going after, and he doesn't name him, but he says, he says, uh, the author records these facts in a very objective way, all right? He says that it would be incorrect to read into these paintings any criticism of the sitters. There is no evidence, said author says, that Halls painted them in a spirit of bitterness, all right? The author considers them, however, remarkable works of art and explains why. Here he writes of the Regentesses, right? And then, okay, shovel please. Each woman speaks to us of the human condition with equal importance. Each woman stands out with equal clarity against the enormous dark surfaces and yet they are linked by a firm rhythmical arrangement in the subdued diagonal pattern formed by their heads and hands. Subtle modulations of the deep glowing blacks contribute to the harmonious fusion of the whole and form an unforgettable contrast with the powerful whites and vivid flesh tones where the detached strokes reach a peak and breadth of and strength. Okay? Italics, Berger. What does Berger want to say about this? 
He Berger responds. The compositional unity of a painting contributes fundamentally to the power of its image. It is reasonable to consider a painting's composition. But here, the composition is written about as though it were in itself the emotional charge of the painting. Terms like harmonious fusion, blah, blah, blah. It's all just, it's all ridiculous. Unforgettable contrast. Um, reaching a peak of breadth and strength. This is like the most, it, it's like the worst kind of egghead pablum, you know. And I'm sure that said author of Volume of Halls was a person of great repute and was remunerated for the spewing of stuff um, quite handsomely. Um, however, um, transfer the, it's like, um, he transfers the emotion provoked by the image from the plane of lived experience to that of disinterested art appreciation. All conflict disappears. One is left with the unchanging human condition. Right? And we want to talk more about that. This whole idea of um, this of the ways in which some of these works portray this unchanging human condition. All right? Um, and what that means, and how it's kind of like bogus. Um, all conflict disappears when it's left with the unchanging human condition and the painting considered as a marvelously made object. Very little is known about Halls or the regents who commissioned him. It is not possible to produce circumstantial evidence to establish what the relations were, but there is evidence of the painting in Evidence of the paintings themselves, the evidence of a group of men and a group of women, women as seen by another man, the painter. Study this evidence and judge for yourself. You know? <clears throat> and what does he say about it? Look again at the paintings. Look at the way the women are portrayed. You know? That... Here's the takeaway, my friends. What Berger is attempting to say here is that if all art is an interpretation, then, you know, an artist with any kind of uh, stylistic uh, nuance is going to perhaps use this opportunity to vent his spite at these people by kind of making them look fairly forbidding and unyielding and stern and anemic and not necessarily portray them in their most, you know, beauteous light, you know? And what do we get with these paintings? What Berger's attempting to say is that, you know, um, if we understand the relationships of painting and art to their subjects, we can see sometimes, you know, the history of class relations, all right, that we can see within the style, within the style that Halls uses, you know, a certain critique on these people, perhaps even unaware to, unawares to them, all right, that if we understand the relationships, we can understand um, the possibility, we can be able to read these paintings in a different light when we understand the relationships of the subject to the artist, you know. Um, <clears throat> it was said of Michelangelo Bonarati, the great um, um, Florentine and, and, and later Roman painter, um, that... Um, you know, Michelangelo painted, um, you know, and this is immortalized in um, the one um, with uh, the, the film with Charlton Heston, what was it called, where he, where he portrays uh, Michelangelo, I can't remember the name of it, um, Rex Harrison is uh, the, 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 uh, the Pope, um, I believe like uh, Pope Medici. And um, the struggle that goes on between the Vatican administration and all the v Vatican bigwigs on the cardinals and, you know, people like, you know, 
picking picking on Michelangelo or like forcing him to do certain things that he didn't want to do. So a lot of the people, so if you ever get an opportunity to go to the Sistine Chapel and see the um, the ceiling, the ceiling basically is this um, paint, is basically this kind of representation of the entire Christian cosmology of heaven, purgatory, hell, um, and all these suffering souls and, and people reaching out to God and the whole, the whole shebang, the whole kettle of fish, you know. However, what Michelangelo ingeniously and surreptitiously did was he took some of these people that he didn't like, you know, they were kind of bugging him, you know, this great artist, you know, having to like put up with swine, and he took said cardinals and prelates and, and pontiffs, and he put them in hell. He put them in hell. Um, in the paint. Um, to, you know, kind of get back, you know, the, 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 the power and gifted in him to make a critique, you know, um, of, these, of these said people. And this is what Berger wants to say about this, like, attempt at mystifying these paintings through art appreciation, whereas we should... I mean, all that is there. I mean, certainly one should not get out of the game of looking at things formalistically. We, all, we need that. We need that kind of understanding of things. We need to understand, you know, um, um, patterns and shading and, and, and the artistry of, um, of the arrangement and the interplay of light and dark, you know, uh, and all that formalistic... Um, all, all of those formalistic aspects. However, you know, if we're not looking at things in terms of the relationship of the classes, you know, who was doing what, we're missing something. We're missing the history. And we're missing perhaps what was going on in Franz Hall's mind at the time. He painted these guys. A lot of people have said, for instance, of this one, it's been said that the one... Here, what looks like he's inebriated, um, and um, he may well have been, but Halls didn't pull any punches and like just making him look like he was just drunk, you know. <sighs> Gotta bring this up to be bigger. Mystification has little to do with the vocabulary used. Mystification is the process of explaining, of, and this is Berger again. What does he say about mystification? Mystification is the process of explaining away what might otherwise be evident. Halls was the first portraitist to paint the new characters and expressions created by capitalism. He was one of the first, he, he is in this period when we, when Western European culture is moving into mercantile capitalism. And with that will come the separation between the haves and the have-nots, and we'll talk more about that. He did it in pictorial terms. He did in pictorial terms what Balzac. Balzac is a famous French writer that will come later on. You should read him. Um, did two centuries later in literature. Yet the author of the authoritative work, remember the egghead guy that wrote the book on Halls. Um, Yet the author of the, authorita of, the, of the authoritative work on these paintings sums up the artist's achievements by referring to blah, blah, blah. Once again, Hall's unwavering commitment to his personal vision, which enriches our consciousness of our fellow men and heightens our, all, our awe for the ever-increasing power of the mighty impulses that enabled him to give us a close view of life's vile forces. Vile. That was a Freudian slip. Life's vital forces. What's Berger say about this? All this kind of prancing around. He says, that's a mystification. So he's basically calling this guy on his bullshit. In order to avoid mystifying the past, which can equally well suffer a pseudo-Marxist mystification, he wants to run a disclaimer here. 
that sometimes, you know, a Marxist reading of class struggle might be a little bit overdetermined, too. That we need to always be critical of interpretations, no matter who they're coming from. In fact, remember what he says at the end of chapter one, or the end of episode one. You need to be critical, even of what I am saying and presenting to you. He's running this disclaimer, you know. It's like, you know, I'm just giving you my opinion. You know, check it with your own sense of reality. <clears throat> he says, let us now examine the particular relation which now exists so far as the pictorial images are concerned between the present and the past. If we can see the present clearly enough, Berger says, we shall ask the right questions of the past. If we see the present Clearly enough, we shall ask the right questions of the past. Back to the matrix. Once we see clearly what has happened in the matrix and in 2020, we can ask the right questions about how this came to pass. Classical perspective just doesn't People don't just start painting in this particular kind of way. Just No one just got up one day on a clear day and whatever, you know, 1350 or whatever, and said, you know, I'm going to paint, you know, all these guys are painting all this flat shit. I'm going to, like, paint in perspective. No, didn't happen like that, my, my friends. It was a long... process of trial and error that involved all different areas of both the natural sciences and art, right? People doing, people studying optics, people studying geometry, people studying light, you know, the, the nature of, in order for every, for all this to happen, so that now we get a picture that in fact, within this particular one, we see these um, blue lines kind of, kind of culminating here on the right-hand side because within this particular painting, this is what we call the point of infinity or what is also called um, the point of inf infinity or the, um, or the um, point of perspective. Right or the vanishing point, what is called the vanishing point. All right, and in order to develop a painting that looks like this, it took a lot. It took a lot of people working together collectively, an entire culture, to start to understand how to represent volume and shading and all this. So then we look when we look at the painting, we look at it with a set of assumptions. Basically, it's like. You know, now all of a sudden what happens is that we're looking at something that looks like we're looking through a window, right? We're looking at a window and, you know, our minds, you know, make these assumptions that, you know, the people here are um, closer to us out the window than the people back here. And this is back about, you know, 70, 100 yards or whatever, and this, is in the, and this is in the background, and this is that, and this person is closest to us, and these are lined up in a way in which this one is further away than that one. All right? We make all these assumptions about the volume of this thing. However, I would point out, and what I usually do when we're, when we're in a brick and mortar setting is I'll just put my hand under the screen. But, folks, back here behind the screen, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. There is no volume. There is no perspective. It doesn't go anywhere. It's the representation of three dimensions in two. But we understand and our minds are able to process perspective in a way in which we understand the way that this person is further away, not unlike the way that we see normally, right? So that there is this attempt with classical perspective of capturing reality as such, all right? How we process reality heretofore, up to that time. 
So, with this whole Western perspective, and he even says in, the in, in that introduction that I, that I was talking about, there's this whole set of different assumptions that we need to understand in order to make sense of it. In order to make sense of, like, Western perspectival paint. Because all of it will pretty much be kind of of the same variety in terms of these, this list of things that are intimately connected with like most representational art, right? Number one, A is this, Western classical perspective. And this needs to be stressed. And I think, the, and I think that the title of the book itself is like instructive here. It's a kind of perspective. It's a style of perspective. Is it reality as such? No. No. You know, although one, you know, one within this system would claim that, yes, this is, this is reality. Uh, it's a particular way of seeing reality. All right. Where I'm looking through a window. Could art be other things? Obviously, yes. And we'll talk about the ways that art will contend with this perspective later on. What else does Western perspective do? It assumes a subject. It's, it assumes a spectator that is essentially set apart from, it makes, a, it makes an assumption about who it's painted for and that that person will be standing back from it. And it assumes that I am here and the world is out there. That the subject himself or herself is essentially set apart from what she is seeing, right? There's the there's the window, and there's the what, and, and 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 there's what I'm seeing, but I'm not part of it, right? I'm not involved in any of it. I am like this onlooker, this um, detached on. It, it assumes a kind of detachment on the part of the subject. It assumes that the spectator is at the center of the world, right? Because of the way that it is um, presented to us, right? It is presented like anything else, whether it be theater, whether it be painting, whether it be photography. There is always this kind of, um, or film, there is always this kind of frontality to the whole thing that assumes that we are playing, you know, say I'm doing theater right now. Even even what I'm doing right now, right? I'm sitting in an empty room, right? With this whole setup that's kind of here. And I'm, and I'm bringing it to you, assuming that... And you will take it up as the spectator whose assumed position and relationship to it is the center. You are the, you are the most important point. You know, when, for instance, when, when you go to see a play, the actors more often than not will be playing their respective characters and the action and all that in a way in which you are made, you are made, you are given access to the whole thing. You know, that you are the most important point. There's no, there, you know, there's no, it's all kind of for you. It's for the audience. You know, irregardless of whether there's things within the narrative that are tempor temporarily hidden or revealed to you, same thing with films. You go to a film, the audience sits, sits in the theater. The whole thing is being played out. It's not as if, you know, the Marvel characters are, you know, you go to a Marvel film or whatever. It's not, it's, it, it's like the director directs and edits and shoots the film with the assumption that, you know, he's not, he is totally cognizant of the person watching it. He's not hiding anything. He's not, you know, um, it's all front, the frontality of it is all, it, it assumes that you are the center. You are the, you are the customer. You are the one that's taking this in, you know, over and above the world. That the world is there and this assumption also will imply that the world is there for the individual, for the subject himself. Hence this idea of individualism, right? Of pe of, It's like, and this is a long, that's a long, long tale. 
all right? But we have to understand if there's any takeaway here with this idea is that what we, how do I say this? What, the ways in which our culture and civilization views the individual as being separate from the rest of having needs. It's like it's like I have these needs, and 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 I'm a and I'm a person, and I'm, and I'm a guy, and I deserve these things, or this bad thing happened to me, you know, or this good thing happened to me, or or whatever. It's all kind of about me. You know, and that, and and this idea of center of, of individualism was was something. I mean, believe it or not, think about it, think about it, think about it historically. This kind of individualism that we are experiencing now as being distinct entities from um, our parents and the rest of the school and this whole. Um, this whole system of reinforcements, you know, through the advertising industry or a school of like, you know, do your own thing, chart your own course. It's like, you know, it's you're like, you deserve it. What have you done for me lately? You know, it's like, well, we were, it's like we were talking in the other class about this somewhat ridiculous new Cardi B video that was kind of all about her. Um, but that this style of thinking about the human subject was not always as pronounced as it. Bec it, it was something that developed, you know, out of a far more collective and tribal and communal consciousness about stuff. Is this to say that people before this period did not were not self conscious? No, it's only saying that the em the emphasis on individualism is something that is developed and progresses with time. And we'll see that this individualism will be the function and raison d'etre, the reason for being of capitalism itself, all right? And, you know, a woman, uh, a former prime minister of the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher, would go as far, in the 1980s, she would go as far as saying, there is no such thing as society. There are only individuals. Right, kind of trying to like hammer home the point, you know, just sell this crazy ass idea about the distribution of labor and goods and service. Um, individualism is something that develops, all right, and art helps that individualism along by by its form of perspective separating us out so that we become individual. It assumes that number D. Uh, letter D, it assumes that what is out there is something to be assessed, all right? That, that there is a level of a detach, uh, there's a level of detachment here that involves this kind of subtle development that the thing that is being presented to me is for me. It is something for me to look at or in, in more subtle ways, it's something for me to, it's out there, I'm here, right? That, that something which is out there is something to be assessed. It is there for me. It is there for me to assess. I frame it. I frame it with my own consciousness. Um, but also there's this sense that I possess the thing, all right? This subtle feeling that the thing is there for me, whatever the painting, whether I own the painting or not, at the time which I am seeing it, at the time which I am watching something, it is there for my consumption, for me to possess it, it is, me for, it's, it is there for me to use it in whatever way I see fit, it is configured, uh, um, I configure it with my mind and my eyes and my ears. Um, it is something to be formulated. I formulate it. I have thoughts about it. I think about it's like I have opinions about it. Um, and dominated. All right. It is something that, and, and that's a little more subtle, but this idea that it's there for me as I'm kind of in psychological mastery of it. And, I, and, 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 and the way that things are portrayed are that this thing is for you to do with what you want, to extract its value 
You know, when we see a landscape painting, the way that it's framed off, it gives us a sense of being distinct. Distinct from nature. Not immersed in nature. All right? That there's a psychology and that there's a politics working here in formulating certain ideas of, that I have about myself in relation to the world and other people. Um, there is me, and there is the world out there for me. The world is there for me, to do what I need to with it, to turn it into a career, to, tur to turn it into a life. Um, Birch will argue that this is the perspective of God over his creation. It's a very godlike perspective. This and uh, in the ways that we talked about this, you know, the ways in which we envision God, you know, the images that we have of God. One of the more ant and I used to have a slide, and it's up on my Z drive up at school, and I can't get it. There used to be a slide here of like God the Father looking down from the heavens upon His creation. I made this thing. And what Berger will say is that it is that kind of godlike perspective that is the is assumed in every kind of pain. You know that we are kind of master of of what we survey, um, and then the perspective and and then through this process that perspective becomes synonymous with what we consider reality. That becomes reality for us, but that reality exists in an entire set of different assumptions, all right? Then something happens, you know? Um, and this will be going on, running parallel, but we'll finally see its fruition around the middle of the 19th century. Photography comes in, folks, and it's a horse of a different color, as they say in The Wizard of Oz. Um, photography will come in, and photography will come in, and it will do something entirely different. All right, not entirely different, but different enough that it will, according to Berger, question many of the initial assumptions of classical art, and it will do it in certain ways. All right, he says, with the emergence of photography, the status of Western perspective and that first person point of view will start to change. We'll be able to, and we'll see with that movie, um, he shows a clip from a film by a Russian film director by the name of Ziga Vertov that came out in the 1920s and mid-20s called The Man with the Movie Camera. And <clears throat> Ziga Vertov will be one of the first really, really well-known experimental filmmakers that um, he will be a pioneer uh, if you have if if you haven't seen Man with a Movie Camera, you should watch it. You know, um, it's uh, it's a feature length film. But what he essentially does is in this film is he tries to really kind of take the motion picture camera where he thinks that it should go in the sense of like, wait a minute, because before that, before Verdov start, starts working and other people will start working alongside him. The films that come out before, and there's already, by the time that Verdov makes Man with a Movie Camera, there's already a flourishing Hollywood system and industry that's basically doing primarily what we can call photo plays, or, you know, adapting theater and narrative film and, 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 and telling stories in a very, very frontal kind of way. Um, there will already be that tradition in Hollywood of this kind of telling a story and 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 a lot of critics of the early stages of um, film will 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 post the critique of it's like why would you just take theater another medium and just tape it or film it why maybe film is supposed to do more than just that and Vertov would investigate that. Um, and he would write this manifesto, but he would talk about it. And he, and he would start a whole group of, you know, it's like these, these eggheads, the first thing they do is write a manifesto about, you know, I am the eye, the camera, I. It's very hyperbolic. 
very exact. It's like, you know, but, you know, when you write a manifesto, you kind of got to be full of yourself in the first place. That this whole group starts that wants to contest what the camera can do. And we, um, we see that in that clip. I am an eye, a camera eye. It was very poetic. But um, with the emergence of photography, the status of Western perspective, first person changes. And then Berger will say, it was not so easy to think of appearances always traveling regularly to a single center after the camera. It wasn't always, it, it was like, you know, <clears throat> did most of photography up to that point and does most of photography still play with the idea that it's being done for you? You know, how do we take pictures? Oh, you know, it's like, you know, take for instance, like, um, a family photo, right? It's like, here's like, you know, Mr. Billingsley and uh, Sally Billingsley and little, little Chip and Sparky or Schnauzer, we're all in our matching Christmas pajamas and we're sending a postcard to you. You know, and it's very, you know, and it's very frontal. You know, it's only the gag, but every once in a while, you know how people do like the gag family picture where everybody turns around. And why is it a gag? Because that's not the way you do it. Hence the gag. It's like, it's always frontal. It's always like facing. It's always as if you know, the thing were for you. And what Vertov wanted to do, and what Berger says photography will do, is, ta is, is get us to start thinking in a way that wasn't so man-centered, that wasn't so anthropocentric, that wasn't so, like, this thing is for me. It could get the things we couldn't. It could see things, in, in, and Vertov will play with this. It will see things, in, as, you know, Ferdo was doing motion pictures. We're talking about photography here, but they'll they'll essentially do the the same kinds of things. It will be this kind of democratizing influence on our perspective that we won't be so full of ourselves, right? And thinking that we are the only eyes that exist, that we are the only perceivers of the universe. But now with the camera, what we have essentially is another perceptual, even if it's if it doesn't know it's perceiving, we have another mechanism of optic perception that we can put, it's like, we can put in places where we can't go. You know, put, you know, think about Go GoPros, you know, put them on, it's like, think about surveillance cameras at the um, grocery store or whatever. It's like, this is like, this eye up there, does anybody actually sit there and why it's not somebody just sitting there and watching, it's this non human eye. So, it what motion pictures and photography will do is take us kind of like kind of put us back in our place as to you know being the sole per godlike perceivers of the universe, and that the camera and hence. Vertov's celebration of, of this eye, this what he'll call. In, in Russian, the kino eye, or the cinema eye, or the photo eye, that um, is um, is not human. You know, this kind of celebration of the non-human. And what are these changes that photography does? One, photography takes the emphasis off of the first person, off of you as being the center of existence, individual perspective, and it relativizes it. Everything becomes relative with the coming of the camera, right? We can take pictures. It's like, for instance, it's like, you know, let's say like, you know, I got a camera and I drop it and it goes off, you know? It's like, I have nothing to do with what that camera is photographing. It does what it does, irregardless of my actions, all right? Hence this idea of something... Um, relativizing our perspective, right? It's like right now. It's like I'm doing this. I, I, for instance, right now, this camera is 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 recording me. I mean, I'm not behind it. I'm not I'm not working it. It's running itself, and it's it's basically doing what it has to do. But it has its own perspective on me, right? 
And now, and, and once I'm done with this, you'll watch it, you know, and it kind of is calling the shots on what you're allowed to see, you know. Um, the photo takes the emphasis off of the image as being, this is a harder one to get. The photo takes the emphasis off of the image as being timeless and eternal. Remember, before this, all we have is painting. There's nothing else out there that accurately represents reality as such. It's always somebody's interpretation. And the ways that paintings are always done, the ways that paintings are always presented, is always from this kind of timeless, like time, it's just like frozen time. Frozen time, like frozen, not that a lot of photos don't do that also, but, but, but here there is, a, there is this kind of assumption that, you know, I mean the very fact that this thing happened, this is a picture of something that probably took place in the 14 or early 1500s, draws attention to this kind of timeless nature of it, that it doesn't really occur in time, you know. With photos, it's all about exposure. It's about, all about something instant, and it draws attention to the time-based nature of the image far more than the assumptions that we make about classical pain, where there's a sense, especially depending on its subject matter, because, you know, in the first, in the first episode, um, Berger will show paintings of like the three graces and mythological characters and Pan and arrows and all these things. And all of that subject matter always assumes this kind of timelessness, this mythological timelessness and stuff, right? And that's kind of a hard idea to get. But uh, it takes the emphasis off, off the image as being timeless and eternal. It draws attention to the fact that images are created in time. This is what photos do. Photos take us back to the idea of history, right? That somebody was in a certain place and took this picture when? When somebody did a painting of the Last Supper, or Heracles, or Hercules fighting the eight-headed Hydra, or, you know, Persephone and, and, and Hades, you know, striking their agreement, these things may or may not have like actually occurred in 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 life, you know. Um, but with pictures, it's like it's always about. I mean, you can stage pictures, you can Photoshop. We'll talk all about this. But when I see a photo, it's essentially a photo of something that is occurring in reality. Um, so it draws attention to the fact that images are created in time. They are historical, and they can provide us with real information concerning our status. In ways, is that to say that, is he trying to say that paintings don't do that? No. But that photography has a certain thing that it does, a propensity to secularize things in a way the paintings don't. All right? It just does, it, it's like the one thing does some, one thing, it's like we have to start to understand this idea of media specificity. All right? How one form of media has a certain, and we talk more about this in the other class, about media bias. How some things do something a lot better or a lot more efficiently or have a propensity or a bias towards a certain form of representation that is specific to that medium that other things don't do, right? Like, it's like, you can't do... We'll go through all of this. You can't, there's certain things you can't do with photos that you can do with motion pictures. There's certain things that you can't do with paintings that you can do with a photo, right? On the, going back the other way, though, in reverse, there are things that you can do in a painting that you can't do in a photo, you know? Unless, we'll talk about Photoshop and design and all that, but... You know, we need to talk about oil painting as having a very, very distinct set of operatives that it does exceedingly well. You know, we'll talk about what it does well. And this is just a uh, a repeat of uh, what Vertov, uh, him quoting Vertov in the first chapter, him quoting Ziga Vertov in the first chapter. I'm an eye. 
a mechanical eye, I, the machine, show you a world the way only I can see it. This is I, the machine, maneuvering in the chaotic movements, recording one movement after another in the most complex com combinations. It's like he's trying to speak for the camera, and the camera is kind of like, here I am, you know, like valorizing itself, you know, triumphantly saying, I have emerged, here I am, you know. Um, freed from the boundaries of time and space. I coordinate any and all points in the universe. I can be anywhere. I can be here. I can be there. I can be under, I can be under your, your uh, desk. I can, I, I can go anywhere. I coordinate all points wherever I want them to be. My way leads towards the creation of a fresh perception of the world. Thus I explain in a new way the world unknown to you. You know. And then Berger will say, and we'll end with this for today. This is not to say, he'll say, and he'll make a disclaimer here, all right? Because some of you will, like, you know, it's like any of you with any kind of criticism of this would, would say, like, well, it's like, doesn't paintings kind of do a lot of what he's saying that the photo does? And he says, this is not to say, and he says, all right, I'm going to answer that, right? This is not to say that before the invention of the camera, men believed that everyone could see everything. All right, no one, you know, no one made that assumption. This godlike perspective was not something that got extended, you know, um, into all area. Like, you know, no one, no one felt that everyone could see everything, you know. But perspective organized the visual field as though that were indeed the idea. You know, this thing is before me. It has been man. It has been. It has been fa fashioned for my perusal judgment framing form it's like every drawing or painting that used perspective proposed that the spectator to the spectator that he was the unique center of the world the camera and more particularly the movie camera demonstrated that there was no center there was no longer the center of frontality that it, it could go anywhere it could go behind you in front there was no longer this you know we're the regentesses of the alms house you know, or we are the Billingsleys in our Christmas pajamas. There was something that motion pictures can, you know, take the focus off of man, you know, and create and and um, give us the idea that there is no like originating center. That we're not the same, that there's something about it. It's almost like um, this move in uh, astronomy from you know the the Comper the Copernican um, from the initial Copernican system where, like, you know, it's like the Earth is the center of the universe to, like, a Newtonian version where, like, guess what, folks? We're not the center of the universe that we thought we were. We're actually spinning around this thing. And other things are spinning around us, but we're basically not, not everything's spinning around us. It's not all for us. You know, if anything, it's like what the camera and the movie camera will say is everything is not out there for us. It will take us out of this, like, you know, individual-centered, anthro-centered perspective and say, well, there's a whole big world out there and it's like a lot of it we can't see. You know, it's not all there for us. So these will be the initial assumptions that photography will make. And we will also talk about how photog what photography would do to the art world. When we get back together on Tuesday, we'll have to start, we'll have to finish up chapter one. We'll have to talk about what photography does to the art world and how it disempowers and, and gives people a, a kind of control over the art world. And then how the art world kind of takes its power back in this kind of sleight of hand maneuver that we'll call um, the work of art's uniqueness and its aura. And we'll get to that on Tuesday. So we're going to get back together and collaborate on Tuesday at noon. Everybody be there that can be. Um, and then this will be up on the bird. On the bird. This will be up on the blog. We used to say that in like um, in TV news. Like you put something up on the bird, you send it to the affiliate, the, the uh, head office, um, like the CBS or whatever. Um, but this will be up on the blog by tomorrow night, hopefully.
And uh, when we get back and collaborate on Tuesday, um, we'll finish this and we'll get into his next chapter, which is on how, how, how a lot of these assumptions will be carried over into the ways in which oil painting will, will um, configure the female nude as a subject, okay? And we'll get more into that next time. I hope you're well. Um, I'm glad I'm done. Um, I can put this up and we'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>